Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining our online program. My name is Antigone Ladd and I serve on the board here at the Adams County Historical Society. And I have been fortunate enough to host several of our programs. We have pictures up on the screen right now of some of our programs. And I will be bold enough to ask you to help us support our programs by helping us with a donation. I also ask for your suggestions if you have program ideas for us. And we thank you for being regular viewers on our programs. Tonight, we have a very special treat. Well, your first treat is the fact that you can't see my face. Uh, my camera stopped working this evening, so um, you will see my name up on the screen, but we're gonna let Dan do all the work. Our treat tonight is that Dan Vermilia from the National Park Service is our speaker. Dan is not only a great speaker, he is my friend. He has in his past work been at three very important Civil War battlefield sites. He's worked at Antietam, at Monocacy, and at the Gettysburg National Military Park. Now with his passion for World War II, Dan has moved to the, to the Eisenhower National Historic Site, or as we call it, the Eisenhower Farm. Dan has a passion for World War II, and we've spent many hours discussing the veterans of World War II who are buried at the National Cemetery here in Gettysburg. Tonight, Dan is going to combine both his World War II and his Civil War interests in a fascinating topic of Eisenhower and the Civil War. So Dan, I'm gonna turn the program to you. I will get out of my slideshow and let you take over the screen and I will stop share. Okay, my friend, you are on. All right. Okay. Perfect, well, uh, you're on, you're on you. full screen. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for having me. Welcome, everyone, to this uh, Facebook Live event. Uh, I want to thank the Adams County Historical Society for hosting us this evening and giving a chance to talk to you uh, and to share a little bit about the Eisenhower story here in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. As you heard, uh, you know I do work at the Eisenhower National Historic Site. We have a lot of great things. Uh, coming up here at the Eisenhower site for this year. Uh, we can circle around and talk about this again later, but just to make sure I get a, get a plug in right up front. Uh, it is currently Thursday evening on May 26th. As of tomorrow, 27th, we are reopening the Eisenhower home for regular tours and ranger programs. We're very excited about that. Uh, so lots of great things going on here, and we're very excited to be joining you this evening here on Facebook Live. Uh, typically, when people think of, of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, they think of, uh, in a presidential connection, uh, the name that most often comes to mind is that of President Abraham Lincoln, pictured in the very middle of this photograph here on November 19th of 1863, when Lincoln visited Gettysburg and delivered his famed Gettysburg Address. But for all the connections between Lincoln and Gettysburg, he really didn't spend all that much time here. Instead, there was a different president, as you can probably tell, being that I'm here at the Eisenhower site, a different president with a much more long-standing Gettysburg connection that spanned for decades. A president who also spoke in the National Cemetery on November 19th. His speech was November 19th of 1963. That's right, our very own Dwight David Eisenhower, pictured here speaking on the 100th anniversary of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address in the National Cemetery here in Gettysburg. And this is our topic this evening, uh, Eisenhower and Gettysburg, or Ike, as he is often known with his, his famed nickname. Eisenhower had a lifelong connection to Gettysburg. Uh, not only did he have a home here that he used during his presidency and his retirement years, the home that is now preserved as a part of Eisenhower National Historic Site, but he had a lifelong connection with the Battle of Gettysburg in the American Civil War, one that we will be exploring here this evening on our program. And there's a few key things that we're gonna look at. Uh, Gettysburg was an important part of who Eisenhower was as a person. 
I think this is true with a lot of us who either live in Gettysburg or work in Gettysburg, or for so many of us who love visiting Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, it becomes a part of who we are, a part of our identity and a part of our life story that you can't understand who we are as people without Gettysburg. I know that's the case with me. I remember coming here as a kid and, and Gettysburg being a formative reason why I became interested in history. Well, Gettysburg played a similar role in Eisenhower's life and that it was key to who he was. He had formative professional experiences here on the battlefield in Gettysburg early in his military career. His study of the battle and its leaders informed his own views on leadership. Uh, Ike was also something of an amateur battlefield tour guide and historian, as, as so many are. He loved studying the battle and talking about the battle. And because of that, he spent considerable time in his life reflecting on the meaning of the battle in the American Civil War. And to start, I'd like to talk a little bit about the farm that Eisenhower came to purchase here in Gettysburg, right next to the Gettysburg battlefield, and actually what happened on that property during the Civil War, because I think it lays some groundwork for our topic here this evening. The Eisenhower Farm in 1863. Uh, this was a property that was purchased by John B. Secker in 1851. And by the time of the American Civil War, the property was being leased to an Adam Bollinger, his wife and their two children. There was a neighboring farm here. You can see on the lower end of this picture, J. B. Secker, and then right below W. M. Douglas. He owned a neighboring property, which uh, we refer to here today as Farm Two. It's where President Eisenhower would one day keep his cattle herd. And there was also a nearby property owned by Samuel Pitzer that is also part of the Eisenhower National Historic Site today. So during the Battle of Gettysburg, there wasn't really heavy combat at the Eisenhower farm per se, but a lot of troops were moving through this property. As you see in the maps here on screen, uh, one courtesy of our, our friends at the uh, Civil War Trust, now American Battlefield Trust, one on the side there in blue shows uh, red lines just to the east of the Bollinger farm there. Uh, during the Battle of Gettysburg, thousands of Confederate soldiers were marching through the same farm fields that Dwight and Mamie Eisenhower would one day call home. And these are troops who are marching onto very, very famous places on the Gettysburg battlefield, places like Devil's Den, uh, the wheat field, and the peach orchard. These are troops that would suffer extremely high casualties in those locations during the fighting in the late afternoon and early evening hours of July 2nd, 1863. Parts of uh, James Longstreet's command, uh, the divisions of John Bell Hood and Lafayette McClaws marching through on their way towards battle at these famed places. In the aftermath of the battle, uh, the Bollingers or Adam Bollinger did file a damage claim uh, filed several damage claims for what had happened with thousands of troops moving through his property. As, as you can imagine, the property suffered quite a bit of damage. Uh, one for over $400 was filed with the state of Pennsylvania in 1868. Listed crops destroyed or taken, animals butchered, possessions taken. While the claim was approved, ultimately Bollinger never received anything. He also filed another claim with the United States Quartermaster Department for over $1,700. And that claim was denied on the grounds that all of the damage was caused by Confederates, which was something the government did quite a bit with these damage claims uh, after the Civil War, saying, well, we talked to, talk to the Southern governments because it wasn't us who caused this damage on your property. And many of these local farms here in the area uh, suffered similar damages during the Battle of Gettysburg. So this was a property here that the Eisenhowers found in 1950. Uh, it was one with a deep historic connection to the Battle of Gettysburg, and that played into one of the reasons why they wanted to purchase this farm. It was a major selling point for them, the history that happened here being right next to the Gettysburg battlefield. But by 1950, Dwight Eisenhower had left his role as Chief of Staff of the United States Army. He was the head of Columbia University, and he and his wife, Mamie, pictured here behind their Gettysburg home, were looking forward to the next chapter of their lives. They were looking forward to retiring. So they purchased this farm here in Gettysburg, a 189 acre farm, again, right next to the battlefield for a price tag of $44,000. And it sounds like quite the steal today. It was mo the most anyone had paid for a farm in Adams County up to that point in time. 
And this farm became so crucial to, to their lives and of course their, their ultimate retirement. Eisenhower would use it very, very often while he was president of the United States in between 1953 and 1961, ultimately spending 365 days here while he was president, either all of the day or part of the day, uh, when you add up all the different days and weekends and weeks. And then it became their primary retirement home after they left the White House. But while they are here in Gettysburg, their farm really is right on the boundary of Gettysburg National Military Park. In fact, this is a historic photograph of the Eisenhower farm taken from the observation tower on Warfield Ridge along West Confederate Avenue on the Gettysburg National Military Park auto tour route. And when Eisenhower was living here, when he was here in Gettysburg, as you can imagine, being a history buff, which we'll talk about more in just a moment, uh, he did spend a lot of time out on the battlefield, taking walks up to this landscape. Uh, you know, when he's living here right on Warfield Ridge within a few hundred yards of his property, there are monuments being placed, uh, many of them Confederate monuments, like the Georgia Monument in 1961, the South Carolina Monument, 1963, uh, Louisiana and Mississippi, 1971 and 1973, respectively. So the battlefield is still an active landscape that's being commemorated and memorialized. The memory of it is still being shaped while the Eisenhowers are living at this farm. Uh, it's also a popular tourist attraction at this time, which is kind of an interesting thing to think about, that you have the president of the United States with a personal home so close to a major national park with hundreds of thousands of visitors driving just right over the boundary uh, from the president's property. And in fact, this tower that this photograph was taken from, uh, as you can imagine, uh, the United States Secret Service was not very fond of this tower being open to the public. So in May of 1955, they requested that it be closed for the president's safety. Uh, Ike didn't really initially like the idea of closing the tower, but he came around to it uh, after he uh, read a book about uh, presidential assassins. For further evidence of Eisenhower's affinity for the battlefield, a, a couple photographs for you here. Uh, one, Ike and Mamie at the Pennsylvania Memorial in 1955, and the other is Eisenhower beaming, standing inside a lobby. That is actually uh, former President Eisenhower at the old Cyclorama building, November 17th of 1963. So yeah, Eisenhower spent a lot of time on the battlefield landscape. It, it was really a very, very important place for him. But his connection with Gettysburg began long before they actually purchased their Gettysburg farm here. Uh, it began really when Eisenhower was young. Like so many of us, his interests were shaped as a young man. As he wrote in his memoir, At Ease, my first reading love was ancient history. He went on to say this, for me, the reading of history was an end in itself, not a source of lessons to guide us in the present or to prepare me for the future. I did not know what opportunities there were for learning. I read history for history's sake, for myself alone. Now, when he's writing of these, of these uh, interests in history as a young man, he's growing up in Abilene, Kansas. He was born in Denison, Texas in 1890, but he grew up in Abilene. And at that time, there are still lots of Civil War veterans around. So Eisenhower is, as a young man, interacting with Civil War veterans. He's hearing from them. And he went on to write this. Had one of our Civil War veterans, for instance, suggested that not many years later, I would visit Gettysburg to study the tactics of the great battlefield where he had fought, my reaction would have been, me? Well, that's exactly what would, would happen, as we're going to see here in a little bit. And Eisenhower, you know, again, he had this lifelong interest in history, and he had a lot of thoughts about history that he formed throughout his life. In his memoir, At Ease, he wrote quite a bit about the Battle of Gettysburg and what he thought it meant. Now, many visitors focus on the greatest hits and the highlights of Gettysburg. Uh, the most frequently visited spaces are places like Pickett's Charge, the fields of Pickett's Charge between Seminary and Cemetery Ridge, Devil's Den, the Boulders, uh, Little Round Top. Eisenhower saw Gettysburg on a little bit deeper level. He said Gettysburg, in fact, was a demonstration of what a tiny portion of a nation's number can accomplish in the shaping and making of history. It's a very interesting way of looking at this battle that was quite large when you think about it. It's the 
biggest battle of civil war, bloodiest battle of the civil war, but it's really just a fraction of the nation's population serving in this battle. He was drawn to examples of moral courage at the battle by George Meade, Isaac Trimble, and Frank Haskell, among others. Eisenhower also had this to say, I plead only for realization that the handful of heroes on a field such as Gettysburg merely symbolized the courage or the daring of the high-spirited initiative of a multitude of men. And we should try to learn more of, this sort, of the sort of men that some of this multitude were. For each of us, among these men and women who never experienced the fury of war, there may well be individuals who unobtrusively but effectively live their lives so that we must acknowledge a direct indebtedness to them. What he's saying here in these passages is that there's value in history and we have a debt to those who came before us. There are lessons we can learn from them. And you might ask, beyond his childhood readings, when did Eisenhower begin to realize these lessons of history? Well, you might say he began to realize them when he first visited Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. This is a very famous historic photograph showing the West Point class of 1915 on the steps of Christ Lutheran Church on Chambersburg Street right here in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Eisenhower's first visit to Gettysburg, as I often remind school students, was as a student as a West Point cadet. This was famously known as the class the stars fell on. 59 members of this class went on to reach the rank of general in the United States Army during World War I or World War II. And in case you're looking in this crowd, which I know you probably are, and asking which one is Dwight Eisenhower, don't worry, he's right there. Decided we'd point him out rather than make everybody guess. And I'll point out another famous face in this crowd, a young Omar Bradley. So Dwight Eisenhower visits Gettysburg 1915. He would find himself back here just three years later when some of these West Point classmates of his and many other young army officers for the United States were either in France or heading to France in 1918, Dwight Eisenhower was headed back to Gettysburg. And why would that be? Well, the United States Army was using Gettysburg National Military Park as a tank training grounds. They used Camp Colt established right in the middle of the Gettysburg battlefield as a place to train officers and men for the nascent United States Army Tank Corps. And they selected a young 27 year old army captain, Dwight David Eisenhower to command this camp. Now it was certainly full of challenges for young Eisenhower. Uh, for starters, how do you train soldiers on tank warfare when you don't have tanks to train with? Well, if you're Dwight Eisenhower, you focus on discipline. You focus on morale. You focus on teaching them useful skills like mechanical skills, how to fix machines, how to do Morse code. And when three uh, tanks finally did arrive in June of 1918, he could train with those. He also mounted flat uh, guns on the back of flatbed trucks and used parts of the battlefield for target practice, which uh, is certainly something I don't think the National Park Service would be thrilled with uh, today. Perhaps Eisenhower's greatest challenge was how to deal with the Spanish influenza pandemic that tore through the camp in September and October of 1918. Eisenhower implemented many different quarantine measures, cleanliness measures, uh, some of the same things we've all seen over the last couple of years, and they proved effective at keeping the camp's death toll uh, relatively low. Over 170 men did die from the flu, but it could have been much worse in a camp of thousands. Now, in his time here at Gettysburg in 1915 and 1918, Eisenhower did really come to gain an affinity and affection for some of these Civil War leaders. And perhaps none he admired more than Abraham Lincoln. This is actually a portrait of Lincoln done by Dwight Eisenhower. Yes, Ike, in addition to being a five-star general and two-term president of the United States, was also a pretty good painter. Over the last 20 years of his life, Eisenhower did over 200 paintings and portraits. He found it was a way to calm and relax his mind. It was something that his friend Winston Churchill suggested to him, Churchill himself a painter. Uh, Eisenhower did this portrait of Lincoln. This is not the one that he hung in the Oval Office, but he did have a portrait of Lincoln as one of four famous Americans in the Oval Office while Eisenhower was president. Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and oddly enough, Robert E. Lee. Ike had a deep respect for many figures from history and the leaders of the Civil War, 
were certainly included in that. And this is what Eisenhower had to say about Abraham Lincoln. This is from a speech that he gave in Kentucky on April 23rd of 1954 at Abraham Lincoln's birthplace. Abraham Lincoln has always seemed to me to represent all that is best in America in terms of its opportunity and the readiness of Americans always to raise up and exalt those people who live by truth, whose lives are examples of integrity and dedication to our country. He went on noting, he was a great leader. I would like to remind you of the methods he used in leadership. You can find no instance when he stood up in public and excoriated another American. You can find no instance where he is reported to, his, to have slapped or pounded the table and struck the pose of a pseudo dictator or an arbitrary individual. If you read these quotes, certainly the image of a great leader comes to mind. And the one thing I am struck by when I read this quote is I think Eisenhower is describing his own leadership style. He was calm, did not shout down others, and he tried to live his life with truth, integrity, and dedication to his country. Lincoln is not the only leader who Eisenhower modeled himself after. That's right. What about his thoughts on George Gordon Meade, the victor of Gettysburg? Well, this is what Eisenhower had to say about George Meade. Meade's claim to greatness in that moment may very well be evidenced by the total absence of the theatrical, referring to Meade commanding the Army of the Potomac at Gettysburg. When thousands of lives were at stake, there was no time for postures or declamations. He went on to note, here is a man that knew he had to win the battle up here because the man was an invader. Mr. Lee was an invader. If he lost the battle here, this was far worse than losing the battle of Fredericksburg or Chancellorsville or Second, Second Bull Run or anything else. It's that sense of strategic awareness, knowing that Meade had to win in Gettysburg in Pennsylvania. And also in that first quote, the total absence of the theatrical, again, is Eisenhower talking about George Meade? Or is he talking about himself? I know he's talking about George Meade, but it sure seems to me, and perhaps to some of you, that Eisenhower is describing his own leadership style. When you think about Eisenhower compared to some of his contemporaries, a George Patton, or perhaps someone we'll talk about here in a bit, Bernard Montgomery, Eisenhower lacked that theatrical sense. He was much more calm. So I think he might even be describing himself here. What about Robert E. Lee? Again, he had a portrait of Lee on the wall of the Oval Office while he was president of the United States. And in 1960, he received a letter from a concerned citizen who was upset over Ike's praise of Robert E. Lee. And this is what Ike wrote in response. General Robert E. Lee was, in my estimation, one of the supremely gifted men produced by our nation. He believed unswervingly in the constitutional validity of his cause, which until 1865 was still an arguable question in America. He was a poised and inspiring leader, true to the high trust reposed in him by millions of his fellow citizens. He was thoughtful yet demanding of his officers and men, forbearing with captured enemies, but ingenious, unrelenting, and personally courageous in battle, and never disheartened by a reverse or obstacle. Now, another part here of Eisenhower's affinity and relationship with the Civil War is that his views on the conflict were very much views held by many at that time. Eisenhower shared a lot of views that are referred to today as part of the lost cause, uh, praising Southern officers, uh, diminishing the role of slavery, the role of African Americans in the conflict. And in praising Robert E. Lee, Eisenhower is using some of this language that was very common during the days of the Civil War centennial in the 1960s, which we'll talk about here more in just a little bit. But he obviously thought a lot about these Civil War leaders. And he was able to put these thoughts into practice when he was spending time on the battlefield here in Gettysburg. He spent a lot of time on the battlefield with various visitors. Uh, after his passing in 1969, one uh, congressman spoke on the House floor giving a eulogy of Eisenhower, noting that uh, right after Ike had left the White House, uh, this congressman, his wife, and their, their two oldest boys uh, went to go visit him in Gettysburg. And he said, I had arranged an appointment with the general because we wanted 
the boys to have an opportunity to shake hands with and see at close range this great American. And we had not expected this courtesy call, but to take a few minutes of Eisenhower's time. The Congressman went on to note that Eisenhower spent almost two hours telling his boys about the Battle of Gettysburg. He had such a passion for it. And it reminds me of some of my friends, reminds me of myself a little bit rattling on about history sometimes. And I'm sure for some of you uh, watching from home, it might remind you of yourselves or friends of yours. You just have such a passion for this. Well, that's what Eisenhower thought. That Congressman who told that story, by the way, was uh, future President Gerald Ford. Few other famous visitors Eisenhower hosted here in Gettysburg. October of 1962, Eisenhower hosted a historian many of you might be familiar, familiar with by the name of Bruce Catton, one of the most influential writers of the American Civil War and Civil War history. Uh, uh, Catton visited here in October of 62. They spent time in Eisenhower's office at Gettysburg College and visiting the battlefield landscape. And that visit went much better than another uh, very, very well-known visit here between Ike and a famous visitor, Ike and Mont, British Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery. The two had a very interesting relationship during the World War II years uh, with Monty serving under Ike. Monty actually oversaw the ground forces on D-Day underneath Eisenhower's overall command. Uh, Eisenhower had a certain ability to get along with people, even if those people proved a bit difficult to get along with, as, as Montgomery was known to be. But he had an amount of patience with Monty, so they did have a very good working relationship in that sense, uh, where Eisenhower could tolerate him when Monty uh, would lose his cool with him. Ike would let him finish and say, Monty, I'm your boss. You can't talk to me like that. Well, in May of 1957, Montgomery came to Gettysburg so that President Eisenhower, the active sitting president of the United States, could give him a tour of the Gettysburg battlefield. On his way to Gettysburg, Monty angered the American press by giving thoughts on the battle, noting that he thought the American generals there did not do very well. He would have sacked Robert E. Lee. He would have fired Lee for his actions at the battle. So before Monty even got to Gettysburg, Eisenhower was already upset with him. Again, this is May of 1957. They're visiting Gettysburg. They're touring the battlefield. You see them here on Little Round Top. Um, uh, when I did Little Round Top programs working for Gettysburg, I would show this photograph and remind visitors that, you know, we asked them to stay off the boulders there um, unless you won the Second World War. So for Ike and Monty, it's okay. Everybody else, stay off the boulders. But uh, they're touring the battlefield. Uh, visiting all sorts of locations. Little Round Top, this is them at the Virginia Memorial. Uh, Eisenhower has a very interesting look on his face here in this photograph. And uh, Monty continued, Montgomery continued to bash the American commanders at Gettysburg, both sides, uh, United States generals and Confederate officers. Uh, so much so that Eisenhower, when he was pressed by this press pool following them around, said, look, I live here. I represent both the North and the South. He can talk, he can say whatever he wants. And he went on to say, if some of the generals who fought here were alive today, they probably would have criticized the way we fought. Well, uh, Monty, after he left Gettysburg, went into the South, continuing his tour of the United States. And uh, Southern papers were not very happy with his comments uh, criticizing Robert E. Lee. Um, the Time Magazine said this, uh, quoting North Carolina's Durham Her Herald saying, well, it was one of those tempests in a teapot in which Americans delight to engage. It gives them a chance to argue without having to decide, to debate without some vital result depending on the outcome. So uh, Eisenhower ultimately had to uh, talk about this in a press conference and walk back Montgomery's statements a little bit. So some of his battlefield visits went better than others. Uh, this is them looking at some of the uh, exhibits in the old Gettysburg Visitor Center. Uh, some of you at home might recall the old electric map at Gettysburg. In an in-person talk, I would ask people to raise their hands if they remember it. So I guess maybe raise your hand if you're at home, uh, if you remember the old electric map. This is Eisenhower and Montgomery looking at the old electric map. And I think this photograph of them on the battlefield, Monty looking down a cannon barrel um, and Ike probably thinking uh, that he's ready for the visit to, to be over perhaps best symbolizes how the visit went. Another visit, uh, Ike and Charles de Gaulle. In April of 1960, de Gaulle came to Gettysburg to visit with Eisenhower in uh, preparation for a coming upcoming summit 
with uh, Soviets, uh, talking about uh, policy before a Soviet summit in uh, Paris with Khrushchev. And Ike said this of Charles de Gaulle, quote, he knows his battle of Gettysburg like a West Pointer. Certainly a very high, high compliment from President Eisenhower to French President Charles de Gaulle. So Eisenhower certainly spent a lot of time out on the battlefield landscape. And his retirement years, when he leaves the presidency in 1961, it is the start of a very important time period in how Americans remember the Civil War, the start of the 100th anniversary the Civil War centennial. Uh, having gone through, it seems like just yesterday, but already 10 years ago was the 150th, the sesquicentennial. We're now into the 160th anniversary of the Civil War. I don't know what fancy word is for 160th, um, but it, every when we look at these important anniversaries, it's interesting to reflect on the different ways that we commemorate and talk about the Civil War. And during the Civil War centennial, Eisenhower was involved with several important commemorations that I'd like to talk about a little bit that reflect his broader views on the conflict, views that were very much shaped by the times in which he lived. One of these happens the first year he is out of office in 1961, where Eisenhower actually spoke at a dedication, a, a, a ceremony, at the Washington Confederate Cemetery in Hagerstown, Maryland, of all places, on September 3rd of 1961. This is a cemetery where fallen Southern soldiers were buried, soldiers killed in action at battles like Antietam. Uh, a lot of Antietam dead, Confederate dead, were buried there at the Washington Confederate Cemetery in Hagerstown. And in his remarks there, he said this, dedicated without reservation to the advancement of our faith and man's divine origin, we thank these men, referring to fallen Confederates, now almost 100 years in their graves for the inspiration they and their equally dedicated opponents in that war have given us in their shining examples of courage, endurance, and fidelity. May we always, in the long and bitter contest stretching out before us, feel our convictions as deeply and so faithfully sustain them as they. It's very interesting. Here you have a five-star general, former president of the United States, praising fallen Confederates who fought against the United States. Eisenhower, again, very, very common at that time, treating the Confederate and Union soldiers and their legacy as the same, using their devotion to their respective causes without mentioning those causes per se as an example that could be used again in the United States struggle against communism during his day in the 1960s. And again, it's very, very common during the days of the Civil War centennial. Another spate, uh, major speech or appearance of Eisenhower's during the Civil War centennial was actually the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. When Eisenhower on June 30th of 1963, as pictured here, gave a speech at Gettysburg High School where he spoke for over and or nearly an hour to an outdoor crowd. And he spoke about perils of liberty facing the country at that time. In their dedication to freedom, thousands upon thousands of our countrymen have given their lives. Millions have stepped forward to offer a similar sacrifice. Thus they gave us freedom and self-government to preserve, cherish, use and pass on to the future. If our minds are truly responsive to the eloquence of Lincoln, our hearts will be filled with love of freedom and country and our wills dedicated to the furtherance of the great ideals of liberty, equality of opportunity and human dignity for which America stands. Thus we in our time shall win the battle for freedom. Again, in 1963, Eisenhower is using the example of Gettysburg and the American Civil War and applying that or trying to apply lessons from that into the United States and its current struggle with communism during the Cold War. One thing that was notably absent from Eisenhower's speech was a discussion of the main cause of the American Civil War, freedom in the United States, the institution of slavery that enslaved over 4 million men, women, and children. And when you recall that 100 years afterwards, the American civil rights movement is in full swing in the 1960s. He's not mentioning it. Well, it did not go unnoticed. 
The Washington Post wrote an editorial noting Mr. Eisenhower did not mention the big issue of this 100th year after Gettysburg, the Negro and his civil rights. Eisenhower would speak again in 1963 on the meaning of Gettysburg and the Civil War. And of these three speeches we're talking about this evening, this was the one where he perhaps came closest to the meaning of the Battle of Gettysburg. It's one we mentioned earlier, November 19th, 1963, when Dwight Eisenhower, former President Dwight Eisenhower was the keynote speaker for the 100th anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. President Kennedy had been the, the ideal choice, but he had uh, commitments to travel to Dallas several days after this, uh, of course, where he would be assassinated November 22nd of 1963. But Eisenhower was one of several speakers at the ceremonies that day. And this is part of what Eisenhower said. Where we see the serenity with, with, with which time has invested this hallowed ground, Lincoln saw the scarred earth and felt the press of personal grief. Yet he lifted his eyes to the future, the future that is our present. He foresaw a new birth of freedom, a freedom and equality for all, which under God would restore the purpose and meaning of America, defining a goal that challenges each of us to attain his full stature of citizenship. We read Lincoln's sentiments. We ponder his words. The beauty of the sentiments he expressed enthralls us. The majesty of his words holds us spellbound but we have not paid to his message its just tribute until we ourselves live it. For well he knew that to live for country is a duty as demanding as is the readiness to die for it. So long as this truth remains our guiding light, self-government in this nation will never die. He spoke about continuing that promise of freedom in the Declaration of Independence, that promise of freedom that Lincoln had spoken of on November 19th of 1863. Again, a little bit more closer to the mark when considering the legacy of Gettysburg and freedom in the United States. But he was not the only important speaker that day. He was joined on the rostrum by other dignitaries, including the great singer, Marian Anderson, very famous figure in American history. In 1939, she had been denied permission to sing at Constitution Hall in Washington, DC. So instead, on April 9th of 1939, on Easter Sunday, she sang for a crowd of over 75,000 people on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. <clears throat> she was part of the, sang at the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in 1963. And she was also awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom that same year. At the November 19th of 1963 ceremony, she sang gospel songs, lead kindly light, and he's got the whole world in his hands. Another address was given that day by the other gentleman picture here, Mr. E. Washington Rhodes, the president of the National Newspaper Publishers Association and a prominent uh, African American, and the publisher, excuse me, of the Philadelphia Tribune, a prominent African American newspaper. Mr. Rhodes's remarks touched on the central issue of the day. 100 years after the Battle of Gettysburg, 100 years after the Gettysburg Address, the anguished expectations and hopes of Abraham Lincoln for a united nation remain unrealized, unfulfilled in American life. The present grave civil rights struggle attests to this melancholy, tragic fact. He noted this, second class citizenship with all its attendant evils must end unless men of substance and creative minds take positive action, move forward with alertness and stout hearts to remove this injustice. I fear that government of the people by the people and of the people will soon be endangered beyond repair. Paraphrasing and even quoting from Lincoln there. So November 19th of 1963, an Eisenhower speech on the 100th anniversary of the Gettysburg Address shows us these competing and conflicting interpretations of Lincoln's speech, Gettysburg, and the American Civil War. Very common for the Civil War centennial. Eisenhower focused on the battle's importance to democracy, seeing it as a call for vigilance and the preservation of liberty. And his speech on the 19th went furthest in reminding Americans that, as Lincoln had said, there was still unfinished work of preserving freedom and liberty for all. And I think places like Gettysburg National Military Park, pictured here with a sunset image beyond a cannon on Cemetery Ridge, and places like Eisenhower National Historic Site, these places are national parks because this is where we as Americans can work through these issues, can look to the past to help understand 
the past not only, but understand the world we live in today. And for Dwight Eisenhower, that is one of the many things Gettysburg was to him. It was a place where he drew inspiration from the past and tried to understand how that inspiration impacted his life and his time and his era. It's one that we still, a question that we still ask ourselves today, how do these landscapes impact our view of the world today? How do these national parks impact the, the view of the world today? And again, places like Gettysburg National Military Park and places like Eisenhower National Historic Site help to preserve that past for us to reflect upon it and think about the world we're creating and passing on. And as we come towards a close here in our program, and uh, hopefully we will have some, some time here uh, in a little bit to, to chat and, and answer some questions, I thought uh, no program on Eisenhower and the Civil War would be complete. Uh, especially with us reopening uh, the Eisenhower home for tours tomorrow, again, uh, Friday, May 27th. Uh, no program would be complete without talking a little bit about if you come out and visit us here at Eisenhower National Historic Site, what are you going to see inside the house? Well, you're going to see further evidence that Dwight Eisenhower was fascinated by the American Civil War. So this is both a pitch to come and visit us and relevant to our program topic. It's a two for one. In the living room of the Eisenhower home, uh, the first room that you see upon visiting the house, on top of one of the cabinets there, there are two small statues. Uh, one of Robert E. Lee and another, which most visitors assume is Ulysses S. Grant. No, it's actually George Meade, the victor of Gettysburg. These were uh, sculpted for him by Catherine Wheeler. In the Eisenhower dining room, there are two whiskey decanters, which are decorated with Civil War scenes. Uh, the one on your left is the scene depicting the last meeting between Lee and Stonewall Jackson at the Battle of Chancellorsville. Uh, the other on the other side there shows a, a cavalry charge. There are corks on each with Robert E. Lee and Ulysses S. Grant on them. Uh, they are very, very cool uh, pieces of artwork about the Civil War. Perhaps the, the biggest way the Civil War is represented in the Eisenhower home is in the book collection. Uh, we have more books on display than we have of any other single item in the home. And one of my favorite parts about this is some of the books on display in Eisenhower's home are the same titles I have on my bookshelves. And I'm sure many of you have on your bookshelves. These are titles that Eisenhower really enjoyed reading. In fact, we have over 1,100 of Dwight Eisenhower's personal books in our museum collection at the Eisenhower site. And over 900, over 900 of them are on display inside the Eisenhower home. So just an example of some of the titles that are on display. Uh, here you see a photograph showing uh, several of Bruce Catton's books. Not only did Eisenhower know Bruce Catton, but he had some of his books on display. Glory Road. Mr. Lincoln's Army, A Stillness at Appomattox. He has Joshua Chamberlain's The Passing of the Armies. Of course, Joshua Chamberlain, a name synonymous with Gettysburg. Other books on display, uh, Stephen Ambrose's biography of Henry Halleck. You have Burke Davis's book, Gray Fox, about Robert E. Lee. In the Eisenhower Den, you have shelves of books about Abraham Lincoln, including a T. Harry Williams' Lincoln Finds a General. So Eisenhower loved reading about Civil War history. His big reading passions were military history and Western novels. Also, the artwork on display in the Eisenhower home, again, reflects his love of Civil War history. In the Eisenhower Den, which is one of the coolest rooms in the Eisenhower home, uh, there is a Batchelder, John Batchelder map of the Gettysburg battlefield. It was signed by George Meade. It was given to Eisenhower by Nelson Rockefeller. In Eisenhower's personal office in his home, he had an excerpt of the cyclorama painting. Not only did he go to see the cyclorama in person, he loved it so much, he got an excerpt of it, excerpt of it for his office wall. I uh, really, really enjoyed that. And just behind Eisenhower's desk in his office, which you're seeing pictured here, uh, the desk itself made out of uh, pine boards taken from the White House during the Truman administration that were fashioned into a desk for Eisenhower based on one used by George Washington. When Eisenhower was at his desk, 
just over his shoulder, who was watching him work? None other than Abraham Lincoln, coming back around. Lincoln was someone Eisenhower idolized. And the image of Lincoln there, it's one that some of our visitors don't recognize. Doesn't have his top hat, doesn't have his beard. He's a more youthful appearance than he would by the 1864, 1865. This is Lincoln in 1860 as painted by George P. A. Healy. On the Eisenhower sun porch, on top of the television, there is a bust of a young Abraham Lincoln. And lastly, perhaps my favorite item in the Eisenhower home, part of the home itself is the fireplace in the living room. This fireplace was originally, it's made of Italian marble. It was originally part of the East Room of the White House from 1853 to 1873. It was taken out due to some renovations, later sold off in an auction. Eisenhower's White House staff found it and they gave it to Ike and Mamie to include in their living room. And when you think about those dates, 1850s, 1870s, well, it's there during the Civil War. When you think about the East Room, think about the history that fireplace as part of the East Room witnessed during those years. Seeing United States soldiers camping in the White House in the early days of the Civil War, and in the final days of the conflict, seeing in that same room, the slain body of an assassinated president lying in state, the body of the fallen and assassinated Abraham Lincoln. And again, of all the leaders Eisenhower looked to for inspiration, perhaps none, he perhaps drew none, none he looked to more than, than Abraham Lincoln himself. I think there are many similarities between these two leaders. Uh, again, thinking back to that Eisenhower quote, Lincoln never uh, raised his hand or shouted down another American. Many, many similarities, but perhaps the greatest similarity between these two is captured in a speech that Eisenhower gave of all places, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. This is a speech that Eisenhower gave on May 27th of 1946. That's right, tomorrow is the anniversary of this speech that Eisenhower gave here in Gettysburg. It was the commencement address at Gettysburg College. When Eisenhower spoke, he was the victorious five-star general, allied supreme commander from Europe. Just the year before he had vanquished the forces of tyranny in Europe and defeated uh, Nazi Germany. 1946, Eisenhower is speaking here in Gettysburg at the same college where he would one day have an office in his retirement years. And his address focused on the lessons provided by the backdrop of Gettysburg. Lessons that Eisenhower had come to appreciate in his own time here, even though it would be just a few years before he would buy a farm here. But this is one of the things he said, to few is given the extraordinary combination of qualities to carry the heavy burden that Lincoln bore. Fortunately, few are called upon to meet the tests he met, but basic to his genius for leadership was a willing acceptance of responsibility and a firm will to render honest service. Of all the similarities that Dwight Eisenhower and Abraham Lincoln had, none was greater than these were both leaders who were in key positions of responsibility at extraordinarily difficult times in American history. And in each case, they had a willing acceptance of responsibility and a firm will to render honest service. I wanna thank you all for, for joining us here this evening. I'm going to uh, stop my, my screen share so I can uh, uh, see you all here. And uh, if we have any questions, perhaps we can, we can answer them now at this time. Uh, Dan, this is Antigone speaking. Um, question for you. Eisenhower also was familiar with the historian and author Douglas Southall Freeman. Would you talk a little bit about his writings and his relationship with Eisenhower? Yeah, so he and Freeman uh, were, were good friends. They were very good acquaintances. Uh, Eisenhower uh, within his library collection has Freeman's uh, multi-volume biography of George Washington. He has his multi-volume biography of Robert E. Lee. Uh, Freeman was a very, very big admirer and proponent of Eisenhower's. And uh, I believe when, when he passed, Eisenhower put out a statement marking his passing. Um, I think his, his affinity for Freeman was again, very, very representative of the time and that Freeman was a very, a, a writer who was extremely sympathetic to the Southern cause. 
Uh, so Eisenhower and his fondness for Freeman's books helps to explain some of why he had such a reverence for Robert E. Lee. Interesting. I also saw on the internet today a press conference. I had written about Eisenhower and the Civil War and up came a video of a press conference where he is confronted with the remarks that Monty made about Robert E. Lee being sacked and the members of the press asked his opinion about Lee and he shared very much like the letter of Scott that he admired Lee's personal qualities. But it's interesting to see how he was able to handle that in a press conference, because obviously people in the South were infuriated. Yeah, I, I think one of the newspaper headlines was Southern blood boils. And uh, Monty himself made a comment to the effect of, you know, this hasn't been this controversial since the Civil War. Um, yeah, Eisenhower had to uh, be a little delicate there. He was worried about losing Southern votes over that. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Would you share with us a little bit about what's going on at the uh, farm this summer? Absolutely. Some activities going on and how people get there because some of our viewers are from out of town and they might like to come. Sure, so yeah, again, we're starting up house tour programs tomorrow, May 27th. Uh, house tours are going to run uh, after tomorrow, Thursdays through Mondays. Uh, there'll be house tours, regular house tours offered throughout the day. The best way to get to the site those days is to take a shuttle bus from the Gettysburg National Military Park Museum and Visitor Center. So uh, you can pick up the buses there. They run hourly from there to the site. So there's lots of opportunities to come out and visit. If you wanted to come out on a Tuesday or Wednesday, we do have some limited on-site parking here. So the site is still open seven days a week. Uh, we've been open seven days a week for the last two years during the, the pandemic with, again, some limited on-site parking for visitors to come out and explore. But again, starting uh, tomorrow, we'll be offering house tours again. But we have some other great programs going on. I would say the best way to stay up with us is to uh, go to our park website, which is www.nps.gov slash E-I-S-E. And another great thing to do would be uh, to like us on Facebook, share all of our, our program announcements and a lot of our virtual content on Facebook. Uh, some of our highlights for this year, uh, we're going to be opening the Eisenhower Show Barn on Friday afternoons for a few hours for our Farm Fridays. It's the only time this summer the Eisenhower Show Barn will be open. We'll have staff there to do some interactive programs and activities. We'll have weekly walking tours of the National Cemetery focusing on fallen World War II soldiers, sailors, Marines, and airmen who are buried there. Those will be Saturdays at 4 o'clock this summer in June and July and early August. Uh, so a lot of great stuff going on uh, at the Eisenhower site this year. And we're also very excited. The third weekend of September, uh, September 17th and 18th, we are bringing back our in-person encampment for our annual World War II weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had virtual versions of this uh, event the last couple of years, uh, but we're excited to have our in-person encampment back, our living history camps. We're working hard at bringing that back. Uh, working hard at lots of new offerings and, and great things for, for the public here at Eisenhower National Historic Site. And you have a Vietnam Walk coming up? That's right, yeah, just this Saturday, May 28th. Um, uh, we are honored to be partnering with our friends and colleagues at Gettysburg National Military Park. Uh, park Ranger uh, John Hoptak and myself at four o'clock in the Gettysburg National Cemetery will be leading a 90-minute walking tour telling the stories of uh, Vietnam War soldiers, uh, Marines, uh, casualties, primarily uh, service members from South Central Pennsylvania who were killed in action in Vietnam and buried in Gettysburg National Cemetery. Outstanding. Okay, Andrew, I don't know if you have any other questions. Um, other than that? Just, uh, we did have one last question. Um, why didn't President Eisenhower choose Gettysburg for the site of his library? I'm sure you've been asked that more than a few times. So I, I think Eisenhower, um, you know, he, he was from Abilene. That's where he grew up, Abilene, Kansas. And he always viewed Abilene as home, even though Gettysburg is the only home that Dwight and Mamie ever owned together. Uh, he chose Gettysburg to be the national park site commemorating him. Uh, we have, it's currently on display in the Gettysburg Visitor Center, a letter he wrote to the Secretary of the Interior 
saying, well, I was asked what site I would like to have designated, you know, as, as a national park site to commemorate my legacy, and I choose my farm in Gettysburg. It's an important place for them. It's the only home they ever owned, and it's right next to Gettysburg National Military Park. So he figured, wow, this is a perfect spot for this National Park Service site. I think he chose Abilene for his presidential library and his burial location because he wanted to go back home. He wanted to go back where he grew up. And having his library there, having his burial location there, that is where he is interred. That is where his wife, Mamie, is interred by his side. And it's where their firstborn child is buried as well, a little boy named Dowd, whose nickname was Icky. He died at the age of three in 1921. The three of them are buried side by side at the uh, presidential library site in Abilene, where Eisenhower grew up. So I think it was, in a sense, returning home for him. And he also knew that, that Gettysburg is a very famous place. And uh, the site here would get visitors because it is in Gettysburg, but I think he wanted to have his library in Abilene to make sure Abilene had a, had a nice way for, for him to be remembered as well. Does his home actually protect the back end of the battlefield? I mean, there can be no developments built there now, thanks to the fact that he donated yeah. the land to the- Yeah, you, you might say in, in doing that, Eisenhower was uh, very preservation minded. Absolutely. Well, Dan, we thank you for an excellent presentation and thank you for sharing those stories. They give a whole new view of President Eisenhower, or I, I think he preferred being called General Eisenhower. Is that correct? He did. And we fought, we fly that five-star flag here at the site every day in his honor. I love it. Well, thank you. And the timing is perfect. We will see you on site at the Eisenhower Farm. Thank, thank you, you everyone for joining. Thank you.